If Miami fixes their defense and just gets it to be a little better, they can win the ACC, they can make the playoff, they can push for a national title. But have they done that yet? You are locked on college football with Spencer McLaughlin, your daily podcast on all things college football, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your daily source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth, whatever those may be. This episode brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with 200 bucks in bonus bets. Guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. We're talking Miami because they beat Florida State. And I mean, it was good. It was, it was fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It wasn't maybe as great as you could have hoped for for the Hurricanes. So what sorts of issues, if any, do they have left on the defensive side? SMU and Pitt, who would you pick to win the ACC first? I don't know yet. I'm going to answer that later. And uh, two teams not in the Power Four that are looking like playoff teams right now, all coming up on today's show. And that is Alex Dono, Locked on Canes, joining me. And let, let's start with that question, Dono. It, it's been a season of not great defense, and Cam Ward, please bail us out and make unbelievably spectacular plays with a good offensive line, a great running game to boot, and a really underrated receiving core. But how, how far along is Miami's defense to getting where they need to go to be a national title contender? Now, I can't answer that question after beating Florida State because, yes, Miami's defense, for the most part, there was one horrific play that they gave up when Luke Cromanhawk, the Florida State quarterback, uh, seemed to be bottled up behind the line of scrimmage on a fourth down run, somehow was able to break free and pick up 42 yards. Those are the types of defensive breakdowns. You've seen at least one of those in just about every game Miami has played so far this year. Outside of that, Miami's D did exactly what they were supposed to do against Florida State. But the reason why I can't answer that question now, Spencer, is because we all know how tragically bad Florida State's offense has been. They haven't scored more than 21 points in any game that they played. Miami held them to 14 points. The second of those touchdowns was scored in in absolute garbage time. So you take that one with a grain of salt. But I also have to take the way Miami's defense played with a grain of salt. Now, um, it's not a completely hopeless defense because there's there's a ton of talent uh, on the defensive line. Um, you know, Reuben Bain has been back for three games and, uh, you know, he did record a sack against Florida State. The prior game against Louisville, he led the entire nation in quarterback pressures and you know, he's only he's only played in a little over three games all season long. Uh, you know, overall, Tyler Barron has played well, but he's taken a little bit of a dip, but Simeon Barrow on the interior of Miami's defensive line has played great. So the D-line, they're giving you the type of performances you would expect. The linebacker play at times has been really good. At other times, there's been some missed tackles. They've been inconsistent. What has been consistent, at least prior to the FSU game, was the defensive secondary having assignment problems, communication problems, tackling problems, just plain old problems. And again, going up against a, a really ineffective Seminoles passing game. I don't really know how much we learned about that group, but Miami does have the type of defense that where they can put enough pressure, they can create negative plays, you know, force hurried throws, they can create sacks, they can create tackles for loss. So it's not like the defense is completely hopeless. They, they, they've just had issues like really uh, playing consistently well and, and communicating in the back end. So It's definitely a question that they have to answer. Now, they took a positive step in that direction because it was one of those things where something had to give, right? With Florida State's offense being so bad and Miami's defense in weeks, what was going to happen? Was FSU going to score, you know, 25, 30 points the way most Miami opponents have in recent weeks? Or was Miami going to hold them? Miami did manage to hold them. Uh, So, you know, we'll have to see. You know, they've got some tests left on the schedule. Duke and Georgia Tech are the next two uh, teams up for Miami. They're also going to have Wake Forest. I don't know how much you're going to learn about Miami in that game. And then a Syracuse offense that at times has been really good this year, not so much against Pitt uh, this past weekend. You know, I, I would say that you know a new question that that people have coming out of the Florida State game, which was a 36 to 14 win for Miami, was you know did Florida State find some blueprint to like at least not not shutting him down, but you know keeping Cam Ward from making explosive plays. Uh, I 36 I don't, I, points, I think, 36 yeah. points. I, I don't know. I don't know that I'm buying yeah. that Dono. 
I, I'm with you, but you know, but Cam Ward, he set the bar so high for himself that yeah. when he only throws for 208 yards, and when he doesn't throw an interception, but actually, or sorry, doesn't he didn't throw an interception, but he didn't throw a touchdown. He caught a touchdown in the game, which was a fun play. Uh, you know, people are now, oh my gosh, did Florida State figure something out? They've got really good corners. They bracketed Xavier Restrepo. Miami instead r- rushed for 230 yards, so they took what the defense gave to them. I thought it was. I thought it was a solid performance overall by Miami. It just it wasn't nearly as exciting as some of their other wins this year. It was kind of a boring installment of the Miami versus. Well, I think Miami's been searching for boring wins. I think I think Hurricane fans have got to be saying, I mean, finally we we get to just kind of cruise and and coast here. A, a couple of thoughts. However bad you think Florida State's offense is, it's worse. Whatever description you use that isn't nice to the Seminoles, it's not harsh enough. It's even worse than you could possibly imagine. But the the second thing, Dono, is I don't think Miami has to, quote unquote, fix their defense to win the ACC. I think they can get by with explosive offense, Cam Ward craziness, win tight games. They've been in those spots and they have come out on the other side unscathed so far this season. I think they have to fix their defense for when they get to the college football playoff if they want to push for a national championship. that That's where... You'd start giving Lincoln, Riley, Oklahoma vibes where it's great. You can go score 33 points in in a game, but if you are giving up 45, well, it's just not going to matter. And yeah, you take a step forward against Florida State. I still need to see more from from the Hurricanes defense to feel like, okay, they they can be a legitimate national title contender because right now I look at them and say there is not enough complimentary football for me to have confidence that they can do that. Yeah, and, and on the, the defensive side in terms of uh, like what they can do to try to fix it, and I don't think there's a magic wand that you can wave on that defense. Now, there there's definitely been some indications of players that kind of play below their potential uh, because it, it hasn't looked like the same defense that you saw you know, in the early season win against Florida, early season win against South Florida. You know, something spooky always happens when Miami starts playing the ACC schedule. It's just weird. Look at Donna with a spooky reference on October 28th. How about it? It it was it was calculated um, in (laughs) terms in in terms of potential personnel changes. You know, Miami, um, there there is uh, a a true freshman safety who's, you know, kind of kind of one of these like phenoms who seems to be earning more playing time in Zaquan Patterson. He's actually shown more stability than some of the upper classmen who have been playing uh, ahead of him. So you wonder if he's going to continue. Um, the play who uh, is probably a top two cover corner on Miami hasn't played since the Florida game, Damari Brown. He suffered an injury in that game. Uh, I don't know how much longer he's going to be out. Mario Cristobal hinted that we might see him at like the back end of the season. But with Cristobal, that could mean next week. It could mean next year. Like you never know. You know, he's not always the most reliable source of injury information. So outside of that, like you're really just you're going to need to count on these defensive backs really internalizing their assignments. And I I don't know. Um, definitely there is a scenario where Miami could end up being like one of these USC teams where they they reach important games potentially in the playoff and the defense gets exposed a little bit and then you find out just how much magic cam ward has up his sleeve because i don't you know that there's a couple of personnel tweaks they can make but i don't think there's a magic wand for this defense Uh, i think you've you've got to hope that your pass rush cannot be contained too much because it all starts up front with them alex dono locked on canes love it as always my man appreciate the time my pleasure spencer have a great rest of your show Uh, So SMU, speaking of the ACC, was the biggest winner in the entire conference from this past week. Not not in margin of victory, of course, but I'm just going to answer this question as best I can. SMU or Pitt? Who's more likely to meet up with a Miami, for instance, in the ACC title game? That is coming up next. First, this episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. How great does that sound? Phenomenal. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you're placing your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. It's that simple. You'll get started with 150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. 
Are, are you aware of a better deal out there? Do you want a better deal? Guess what? You're not going to find one. FanDuel is the place to do it. And plus, everything you want for college football, all these games that we talk about every week here on the show, yeah, they're available at FanDuel.com. Yeah, everything is over there. Every sport that you want is over there at FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Let me pose something to you. If, if I tell you without any other details... A team turns the ball over five times, as in once for every finger on your hand. Do you think they're going to win the football game? SMU found a way to do that. Three interceptions and two fumbles this year. So they're vying, SMU and Pitt are, for that number three spot in the ACC. And they face off this week. Mm. Mm Mm-mm-mm. I can't wait for that one. I don't know how much national hype it's going to get. It will not be under-discussed on this show. This is just the first time I'm talking about it this week. Won't be the last. Because SMU and Pitt have the same number of conference losses right now as Clemson and Miami. Meaning the Hurricanes and the Tigers, they better be careful because they're just lurking. Someone's still going to be unbeaten. Someone's going to pick up another quality win. Here's why I trust Pitt more than SMU. If I assess, which I am, of course, the... uh, the mood of the SMU fan base, what I think it should be after that win against Duke, it's a no vibe. I know they won the football game. They deserve credit for that. This was not a game, if you missed it, that they could have lost or had opportunities to lose, but it went back and forth. This is a game that if you knew how it played out and the number of times Duke had an opportunity to win the football game, you you would bet your life savings Duke won the game. SMU found a way. I'm not trying to take that away from them. But that formula that they put on display in Durham last week, not sustainable. They turned it over five times. Pitt has turned the ball over six times all season. Holstein's thrown five picks and they've lost one fumble. Kevin Jennings threw three interceptions. They could not function inside the 10-yard line. Those sorts of things can be cleaned up, but Kevin Jennings has to get the hero ball out of him. Pitt, on the other hand, is just solid. They, they just look like a solid football team. I don't think they're in the Clemson-Miami realm. They haven't proven that to me yet. But what they have proven is they can win close games. They've come back after trailing uh, by a large margin against Cincinnati earlier this year. And their defense can be utterly dominant at times. Ask Kyle McCord, who was a phenomenal passer, or at least looked that way until he went up against the Pitt defense. And SMU is more offensively driven. Pitt a little more defensively driven, perhaps. But I think Pitt plays a much closer brand of complementary football than does SMU. But still, I like SMU, and I haven't made a pick on this game yet. But those are the two teams that are vying for that next spot in the ACC. And I give Pitt a really nice lean win after last week. But it's a no vibe, bordering on lean lose for SMU because it's not they could have lost the game. They should have lost the game. They had to block a 30-yard field goal with three seconds to go. Heck of a special teams play. Leaps over the guy, does not touch a single lineman, blocks it, gets it to overtime. But SMU was shaky. SMU was very shaky. And every time I watch Pitt in the last few weeks, pretty impressed. Pretty impressed. That game is going to be wildly wildly fun here's a name for you that i just want to throw out there that picked up a called a no vibe win against georgia tech but do you know who only has one conference loss on the year virginia tech now if you remember the commentary about the Hokies coming into the season it was that they're a dark horse to win the acc which they were some people like myself predicted them to win in the nine to ten games range with the schedule that they had, but they lost to Vanderbilt. They lost to Rutgers and everyone in Blacksburg. (sighs) Sigh. Here we are again, waiting to get back. Well, suddenly you look at Virginia Tech and go, well, wait a minute. They've only got the one conference loss. I mean, teams like Louisville have have got two of them, for instance, and um, they're not out of it by any stretch of the imagination. They would need some help, but remember, they play Syracuse this week on the road. That's a tough game, but next week, They host Clemson. They host Clemson. Do you realize that Virginia Tech could, 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 in a very realistic scenario, control their own destiny to get to the ACC championship game? Because if they win that game against Clemson, they've got Duke and Virginia after that. Those are both winnable games, though, going to Duke, as SMU will tell you, is very tough. But Virginia Tech is someone that most people probably kind of wrote off and realized, ah, they're not going to be as good as we thought they could be before the year. But 
They've been playing better at the very least. Defense was stifling, albeit against a backup quarterback uh, for, for Georgia Tech over the weekend, but he gave up six points. How do you want your defense to play when opposing when an opposing team has got the backup quarterback in there? So no team had a better weekend than SMU because they escaped with that particular victory. But just, just keep your eye on Virginia Tech. If they can win at Syracuse this week, it, it's not going to be easy. Cues are going to be on a long rest because they played earlier in the week. They're going to be coming back home. And they are certainly going to be, let's just say, looking for a better performance with alacrity, given how they played against Pitt last week. I mean, three pick sixes in a half. In a half? The Pitt defense was stifling to Kyle McCord, who had been one of the most productive quarterbacks in all of college football this year. We'll just see. Just, just If Virginia Tech can go win that football game this week, Look out for the Hokies because that could be a very interesting game at home. It's in Blacksburg against Clemson next week. Now, Clemson has been steamrolling everybody in sight, but just remember this Virginia Tech team went toe to toe with Miami, who everybody, myself included, looks at as the team to beat in the ACC. But remember how that game went? The whole Hail Mary ordeal? I think it was correctly ruled. I'm just saying. Don't tell me they can't play with the top of the conference because I watched them do it on the road. What do you think they do at home? Got to get through Syracuse first and avoid that look ahead factor. But I would watch out for Virginia Tech. Elsewhere around the ACC, uh, Cal picked up a non-conference win against Oregon State. M maybe that gets them on the right trajectory. I, I just, the Bears have just been the Bears. They snapped a four-game losing skid. They've got Wake, Syracuse, Stanford, and at SMU. Do you know what Justin Wilcox teams have had a tendency to do over the years play spoiler play spoiler and frankly have a schedule play out exactly as it is right now smu does not have the easiest schedule in the world uh going forward because they've got to play pit this week and that game uh is at home in dallas so that's that's better but then they have boston college at home scrappy team that's after the bye week then they go at virginia who's better than probably anybody thought I mean, Virginia had a disappointing loss to North Carolina over the weekend. They, they kind of got housed on their home field. Uh, that, that's definitely definitely a lean lose, if not an outright lose there for Virginia because you had an opportunity to be, have a winning record in conference play. North Carolina's been struggling, but Criswell just kind of went and dealing on Tony Elliott's defense there. But I, I think that for, for SMU to still have to go at Virginia and host Cal at the end of the year could decide whether they get into the ACC title game because they've got Pitt this week. But if they win that game, Job's not finished. Job is not finished. So the ACC is getting wild. The ACC is getting crazy. And I don't think we've seen anyone firmly grasp onto that number three spot to push Miami and Clemson. I still think there's a gap between those top two teams and everybody else, but somebody's there. And Miami's looked vulnerable before. Is Clemson going to keep just boat racing everybody that they play? I don't know. I don't know. We're going to find out this week. But Virginia Tech, SMU, and yeah, Pitt, get used to it. Someone, someone's going to cling to that spot. I just, I don't know who it is quite yet. But between SMU and Pitt, SMU had a great weekend because they were able to find a way to win the football game. Right now, I trust Pitt a lot more than I trust SMU. Let me know your thoughts in YouTube comments or hit me up on X, formerly known as Twitter. Speaking of conference title races, not everyone is going to make the playoff with a Power Four Conference Championship. I'll give you two teams that look destined to make the playoff at this rate without a Power Four conference title and why you need to be aware of them. That is coming up next. First, this episode brought to you by Game Time, which has a neat feature. It's called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Curation makes it easier to save more on everything from sports to concerts to comedy, theater, and everything beyond as well. They've got all-in pricing. Toggling this feature shows the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. Isn't that the worst part? Of buying tickets is you go, oh, it's this much. Oh, it's that much. Well, you just toggle on all in pricing. You don't have to worry about that. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time Picks. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E. That's Locked On College for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. Boise State, a huge, huge outright winner 
from this past week of games. They go on the road Friday night. I thought UNLV would get it done. Boise State instead establishes themselves once again as the favorites in the Mountain West. They are minus 210 to win their conference. Minus 210. There are still games to be played in the regular season, but so far the only team that Boise State has lost to this year is, uh, wait for it, number one Oregon, and they lost by three on the road. And they've also got a victory against now ranked Washington State, talking about them tomorrow on the show. Uh, so Boise State's got San Diego State, that is this Friday. Uh, then they've got Nevada. Then they go at San Jose State. Then they've got Wyoming, who's one in seven. And then they host Oregon State, uh, who right now might be asking me to play defensive line for them in the near future. So when you look at that schedule for the Broncos, where's your upset? Where, where, where's your three of those games are at home. The road games are San Jose State and Wyoming. I, you, you tell me. You tell me. Because if they're going on the road and beating UNLV, this is not a bash UNLV. I, I thought UNLV would win the football game. But I don't give them a lean-lose label there. I think that's a no vibe because UNLV showed they can play with the best team in the conference. UNLV can still get themselves to the Mountain West Championship game and attempt to get a rematch here. But this was a really impressive win for Boise State, and they won this game on fourth down. They won this game, scoring a touchdown on fourth down in the first half, converting in key situations, holding UNLV in key spots. Third and fourth down were huge, absolutely huge in this football game. And on a day where Ashton Genty was bottled up by his standards, 128 yards rushing, but he needed 33 carries in order to do that. 33 carries. My God. Goodness, that's not what Ashton Genty's been about. There was an injury concern in the middle of the game, but Maddox Madsen made some timely throws. And though the Broncos were just three of 15 on third down, which is pretty atrocious, they were four of four on fourth down. And it proved to be the difference in the football game. So Spencer Danielson rolled the dice a little bit. Dirk Cutter, the offense coordinator, boy, did he call a good game. He called a really good game. And this Broncos defense came up with an interception late in the half of Haj Malik Williams, who can throw the ball, has a tendency, though, to want to take off and run a little bit too quickly. He can make a lot of great plays with his legs, but the Broncos defense really, really dialed in in this game. And, and I just don't, I don't see an upset spot. You don't always see upsets coming. That's why we call it an upset. It's why we watch the games, why they're played on the field, the whole nine yards in that department. But when I watch Boise State, if they're winning at UNLV with Ashton Genty having a, eh, whatever football game by his standards. I just don't see anybody that's going to beat him. I, I really don't. Now, could UNLV beat him in a rematch in the Mountain West Championship game? Yes. Yes, absolutely. As of now, UNLV does not control their own destiny to get to uh, the Mountain West Championship game. They've got San Diego State ahead of them. Uh, they've got, you know, Fresno State's only ahead of them because they played another game. They housed Fresno State. But Colorado State and San Diego State are both undefeated in conference play right now. Uh, they've got San Diego State on the schedule. They do not have Colorado State. So what? watch out for the Rams. But UNLV needs them to lose a football game somewhere along the way if they just keep winning in conference play. And we're winding down with opportunities to drop games to decide who's getting into the conference championship picture in every league in the country. They need some help. UNLV will need some help. But if they get there, could they beat Boise State? Yes, they absolutely could. I think they're the team most capable of doing it. And if you're Boise State, you say, Colorado State, go for it. You go, Glencoe. Go win as many games as you want. We'll take you on. I don't think you want to go against UNLV again. I certainly felt... I, ha I had kind of dueling feelings about that game. At the same time, there was every opportunity for UNLV to win the football game. There was also every opportunity for the Broncos to pull away. Neither one of those things happened, but I kept going back and forth on, ah, I feel like it's moving in this direction. Well, now I kind of feel like it's moving in this direction. But if you're asking me right now, which G5 team is best positioned to make the college football playoff? It's the Broncos because they, they just faced their toughest test in conference play and might not have to face them again. Big, outright winner, Boise State, for sure. Uh, a really good lean win here for Notre Dame because I thought Navy would cover. I thought Notre Dame would win. And, and Notre Dame seems to have figured themselves out offensively. So when you've watched Notre Dame throughout the course of the season, early in the year, it wasn't always the most impressive or beautiful thing. It didn't look 
you know, like just a different version of the offense that Mike Denbrock coordinated last year when he was the OC for uh, LSU and Jaden Daniels to win the Heisman Trophy. Their point totals in the first two games, 23 on the road. Well, that's at Texas A&M. That win continues to look really, really good. Then 16 against Northern Illinois. Here's what they've done since then. Just on offense. I'll get to the defense in a sec. 66, 28, 31, 49, 31, 51. Yeah. That's what a playoff team looks like. And Notre Dame probably has to win every single game the rest of the way to guarantee that they get into the playoff. I am not as I have been all year, going to go back and say, no, it was just Navy. No, Navy wasn't actually good. No, Navy, Navy's a good team. And it's not just that Notre Dame won this football game. It's that they housed them. They were forcing Navy to turn the football over. Now, you know, muffing a punt, that was more on the Navy returner than anything else. But Notre Dame's defense is also playing at an exceptionally high level because here's what they've allowed the entire season. We knew that that side of the ball was probably going to be good. They got a lot of playmakers. Marcus Freeman's a good defensive mind. 13-14, 7-3, 24-7, The only team, Louisville is the only team to score over 20 points on the Notre Dame defense so far this year. And Notre Dame rest of the way, Florida State, who stinks. Virginia, better than we thought. I'm taking Notre Dame to win that game. And then it's Army and USC. And Army's currently ranked in the top 25. Maybe they'll be unbeaten as well. But there was every chance on paper for Navy to be able to keep this game close, and Notre Dame just wasn't having it. On both sides of the football, they were incredibly, incredibly impressive. And they have been playing at an insanely high level since they lost to Northern Illinois. It was a wake-up call. It was an emotional letdown game. And they have responded in the best way possible. So coming into this year, I felt that if they beat Texas A&M week one, they'd be a lock to make the playoff. Certainly looks that way. It, it, it certainly looks like if they are able to end the season 11 and one, that's guaranteed. They're into the college football playoff and they'll be hosting a first round playoff game because they don't have a conference championship, so they can't get a bye. They have to host Army. They have to go at USC. Neither of those games are going to be easy. But Florida State and Virginia, I don't think they're going to be able to put up that much resistance. Not if Navy wasn't able to. Army and Navy, a lot of similarities between those teams. We'll see if Bryson Daly in a few weeks can put up more of a fight. Than, than Blake Horvack did. But I, I just think that for, for Notre Dame, they have figured out what they didn't have earlier this year. I think I had a segment on this very show, as a matter of fact, saying, hey, this, this Notre Dame offense, this ain't it. This passing game, it's not there. But if their defense is going to put their offense into advantageous situations, which they've had a tendency to do consistently this year, and if Riley Leonard continues to look like the guy I thought Notre Dame got from Duke in the transfer portal this offseason – then yeah, Notre Dame is is going to cruise into the playoff here. It could all come down to USC because the schedule for Notre Dame, it's not looking particularly strong with Florida State being as bad as they are. But Louisville's solid, who picked up a win. Nice little, I expected him to win. So no vibe for Louisville after going on the road and beating Boston College on Friday night, but still a nice victory for Jeff Brom and company if you are a Notre Dame fan. You are huge advocates of Texas A&M winning football games, of Louisville winning football games, and of Army and USC winning as much as they can. Because 10-2 and two doesn't lock Notre Dame into the playoff, but it doesn't lock them out either. Because that Texas A&M win, a lot of times those early season ranked matchups, you look back and go, that team wasn't any good. Like Georgia Tech beating Florida State was a top 10 upset at the time. Well, Florida State's one of the worst teams in all of Power 4. It is a truly astonishing drop-off. They are horrifically bad. Horrifically bad. But then there are the games, like Texas A&M, who I think at one point of the year fell out of the top 25, or they were ranked in the the low 20s. Yeah, they're, they're the only undefeated team in the SEC at the moment with a favorable schedule. And Texas going there last week of the regular season, I tell you what, it's going to be incredible. That's going to be maybe the best environment in college football that we have seen all season. But if you're Notre Dame, you want Texas A&M to keep winning. So you can say, hey, went there and won on the road. So if you're 10-2 and two and you have a loss at USC and wins over really good G5 teams in Army and Navy and a win over Louisville, who could maybe be a 7-8 win team at the end of the year, you want to be able to look back and say, hey, flagship victory at Texas A&M. Not at home, not a neutral site at Texas A&M. So those two teams, Boise State and Notre Dame, neither one's winning a Power Four conference, but right now both very much tracking to be in the college football playoff.
Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.